meaningful series uh, thus far as we're completing our four-part series on the, on the meaning of Christmas. It is my contention that its real meaning has gotten lost in our culture, in our lives, and even some, to some degree in our churches. And I just want to remind us of things we probably already know but, but need to be reminded of about what makes this holiday so powerful and so special. Uh, if you are, are, are viewing and you have not seen the previous three sessions where we dealt with uh, the person of Christmas, where we dealt with the purpose of Christmas, where we dealt with the uh, perspectives of Christmas, uh, then feel free to contact us at the Urban Alternative and get the, the whole series on uh, the meaning of Christmas because this is a most important holiday because it surrounds a most important person. Everyone who knows me knows that I love football. Football is my favorite pastime. I'm passionate about it. When I was young, I was passionate about playing it. When uh, my son came along, I was passionate about following him when he played it. Uh, so I'm passionate about football. Everyone who knows football, looks at football, follows football, understands that it's all about the football. <laughs> I mean, everything in the game is about this pigskin. Uh, first downs are determined by where you place that football. Touchdowns, whether that football breaks the plane of the goal. Uh, incomplete or complete passes. Did you catch the football? The placement of the ball is where the ball was when the, when the runner fell down. Uh, when you have field goals. It's did the ball go between the uprights. It's all about this football. It, it's amazing that this piece of leather has spawned a multi-billion dollar business. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's made millionaires out of people. It's brought sponsors in. People eat and drink around it. Televisions are turned on to it. All because of the positioning of this one little thing. So this one little thing is bigger than this one little thing. Yes. Christmas, it's about this one little thing that isn't so little because it's affected the world. You think about it. Jesus Christ never wrote a song, yet there are more songs written about him than any person in history. Uh, he never wrote a book, but his book, the Bible, has outsold every other book in history. Um, he never traveled more than 300 miles from home, yet you can't go anywhere in the world where his name is not referenced and where he is not recognized on some level. So... This is not an ordinary name, like a football is not an ordinary ball. It, it has spawned all kinds of things from it. All in his name. Because Christmas is about Jesus Christ. At our church, I have a master key. This master key unlocks all the doors. Individuals have individual keys, but I have a master key that can go anywhere in our facilities because it's designed to work everywhere. Jesus Christ is the master key to understand Christmas. But how do you get this master key to unlock doors in your life? How do we make Christmas and its meaning practical and prevalent for your everyday life and your everyday living? Well, we've been using Matthew chapter Two chapters one and two, really, but chapter two, and I want to look at one verse. We talked about the wise men who, who brought content into Christmas because they came to worship him. Then when they come to where Jesus is, after they found the way to go, they had seen the star, verse nine, and they came and stood in the place where the child was. Remember, he's a child now by the time they arrived. And coming into the house, he's in the house, he's not in the inn. He's a toddler now. 
with Mary, uh, the mother, it says, they fell to the ground and they worshiped him. How did they worship? They fell to the ground. They bowed down. How do you respond to Christmas? You bow down. You bow down. Now the Bible is clear. The Ten Commandments makes it clear. You only worship God. You worship God alone and you bring no other gods before him. None. And yet they fall down and worship a baby. Uh, well, now a toddler in a house bringing their gifts to him. But if you only do that for God, by God's own commandment, and you worship the son and God endorses the worship because he comes and guides them right after they worship, then Jesus Christ is recognized as God. Because God says you can only worship God. That's right. And they bow down to him. They yield to him. If you really want to get all out of Christmas, that like Christmas is designed to give you, you want to bow down. That is, submit your will, your life, your purposes, your passions. All of life is to surround the worship and the recognition of Jesus Christ. They bowed down and then heaven spoke. This is more than going to church. This is more than having a service. This is a recognition of his kingship and lordship. Why is this important? Because the Bible says that there's only one mediator between God and man, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. He is the mediator. He's the in-between person. He's the link to bring heaven and earth together. When Jesus Christ is excluded, the link is missing. And when the link is missing, then there's a gap between heaven and earth. God wants to close that gap through the bowing down to Jesus Christ. That's why I love so much Philippians 2, which brings out this principle. It kind of summarizes everything we've said in these three sessions thus far and concluding within this fourth session. It says, have this attitude in you which was in Christ Jesus. So I want you to think like Jesus thought. Who also, he existed in the form of God. He existed in the form of God. That is, he was deity. You can't exist in the form of God unless you are in fact God. But he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held on to at all cost, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant. The Greek word there is doulos, and it meant a slave. And being made in the likeness of men. So he existed as God, but he got made in the likeness of man. Remember the hypostatic union we talked about? Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him, Jesus, the name which is above every name. Remember, he's Emmanuel. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. That's what the wise men just did. Remember, they fell down of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wow. If you really want to get all out of Christmas that Christmas has to offer, bow down. Now, you can bow later mandatorily, or you can bow now voluntarily but all creation will bow down he says over the earth on earth and under the earth there will be no one who does not bow 
whether in heaven, on earth, or in hell. All creation will be the recognition of the Son. What is Christmas? It's a fresh opportunity to remind you as you approach this new year, bow down. Recognize his lordship and confess it. The word confess means to say the same thing. It means to to agree with God on who Jesus is. That's why even Paul says in Romans chapter 10, if we confess him, we get delivered by him. He's talking to Christians there. And I know we use that passage evangelistically, but he's really talking to Christians about agreeing with the son. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 10, if you confess me before men, I will confess you before my father. If you deny me before men, I will deny you before my father. What is he saying? It is the recognition and agreement with God about me that gains you attention in heaven. It is the denial or the refusal to confess me that gets you signed off in heaven. It is the recognition of the son. That means you can't be a secret agent Christian, a spiritual CIA representative or a covert operative. As I like to say, everybody else is coming out the closet, so you might as well come out too. And Christmas is a reminder to come out and be known as a follower of Christ. That I belong to Jesus Christ and that I bow down. We talked about the inconvenience of the wise men, how they traveled over a long distance. We are all familiar with football fans. Let's look at a typical football day to make my point. There are only 17 minutes of action in an actual football game. 17 minutes of actual physical contact. Now all this attention is for 17 minutes of actual contact. Now this 17 minutes is part of a one hour game. The game, the game clock is one hour. But there's only 70 minutes of contact in that one hour. Some of those minutes are people huddling or people going back to the huddle on a running play where the clock does not stop. So it's a one hour game that has 70 minutes of actual activity. But the one hour game with the 70 minutes of activity is part of a three hour experience. So if you watch a football game, you're going to be sitting there for three hours. When you look at the halftime and the timeouts and all of that, you know, the clock stops on a pass play, an incomplete pass. So now, 17 minutes of action that's part of a one-hour game has now grown into a three-hour experience. If you go to the game, that's two hours worth of drive time. From the time you leave your house, deal with the traffic, park, and walk to the stadium. So now, 17 minutes of action. In a one-hour game, that's a three-hour experience. It's now a five-hour day. But now you got to get back home. Right. So you got another couple of hours because you got to walk to the car. Right. you got to work through the traffic to get home. So 70 minutes worth of action in a one-hour game, that's a three-hour experience, has now become a seven-hour day. Interesting. When you get home, if you're a real football fan, right. you're going to watch Sports Center or NFL Network Absolutely. to show you clips of what you just saw. That's right. <laughs> so 17 minutes worth of action in a one hour game that's now a three hour experience in a seven hour day has now been expanded to review everything you just saw. On top of all of that, you're spending your week with fantasy football if you're a real football fan. That's right. That's right. That's right. So you're spending your week waking, making projections on players and games and all of that all week long. In fact, you're going to even discuss it at work around the water cooler. That's right. Why? Because in your mind and heart, football deserves every week your undivided attention. And you know why it does that? Because you're not merely a fan, you're a follower. What you just entered into was bowing down to a worship service 
around a pigskin. You have adored it, worshipped it, cherished it, followed it. You even paid your tithes when you walked in the stadium. I mean, you know, you brought your gold and frankincense, and you you paid your tithes because you've decided this ball is worth me bowing down, not only for seven hours that day, but it will carry on my thoughts all week long, and I will anticipate my next worship service. Well, now, if you can bow down to pigskin and you consider it worthy of all of that, Christmas should have no problem getting your undivided attention and causing you to be like the wise men. You bow down. A man who died was one day having an auction of all of his valuables, and he was a very wealthy man who passed away. And so everyone knew how wealthy this man was. And so because they knew how wealthy this man was, uh, they knew that all of the things he was going to be auctioning was going to be very valuable and expensive. So the day of the auction came, and they all gathered. When they all gathered, the auctioneer came, and he hit the gavel, and he said, the auction is now open. The first thing we're going to auction is a picture, a painting of this man's son. So they were going to auction this picture of this man's son. And so the portrait came out and he said, who will start the bidding? No one responded because they were interested in all the other expensive stuff. This was just a regular painting of a boy. There wasn't anything special about this. It wasn't real expensive stuff. He said, the floor is open for a bid. No one bid it. He said, does not anyone want this picture of the man's son? The man had a servant who had worked for him when he was alive. And the servant, seeing that no one was bidding on the son, raised his hand and said, well, you know, if no one will else will take it, I'll take it. The servant said, I'll take the picture of the son. The auctioneer said, well, since nobody's bidding on the son, uh, we will let the servant take this picture of the son off of the hands of this auction. When the servant came and picked up the son, the auctioneer hit the gavel and he said, the auction is now over. Everybody's looking around. What do you mean the auction is just all over? You just, all you did was bring out the picture of the son. He said, I know, but in the will of the father, all right. he willed that whoever took the picture of the son got everything else. He wound up with everything simply because he took the son because with the son came everything else. There's a lot of stuff out here for Christmas being offered you. A lot of it's expensive, valuable. It has the glitz and the glitter of the holiday. But at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of the Father. So whatever else you're looking for in life and in this world and during this holiday season, take the sun. Because whoever gets the sun it's anything and everything else God has prescribed for them if they bow. This Christmas, bow down and let's discover in this new year what the everything else is that God has for you.